Hi, it's Hugh Foster here with a brand new tutorial series. It's time for Quick Licks. So, <laughs> you might be aware of another original tutorial series that I do called Baselines, which are original base tutorials in the style of certain players, genres, etc. Uh, this one is a little more simple, a little more straightforward, bite size, hence the name. Uh, Quick Licks probably isn't the most original name, but I'm running with it, you know, it's 2021. Is anything original anymore? Probably not. Uh, but yeah, before we break it down, let's just hear it once more, just slow down. All right, one, two, three, four. harmonics at the end there totally optional I know yeah so let's get into the theory behind this one I've called this exercise parallel major sevenths I will do a quick explainer on what each part of that title means hopefully clearing up some of the jargon there if it's unfamiliar to you so first of all you might be unfamiliar with what a major seventh chord is so let's just get into that really quickly um most chords can be boiled down to triads um, a series of three notes and most commonly they can be major or minor let's take a major triad in this case d here's d so let's play all the notes from that so we've got d as the root then we've got f sharp the third and then a the fifth so you can go a little further than that into what we call extended harmony and usually the first port of call there is the seventh. In this case, a major seventh, which is C sharp. Root, third, fifth, major seventh. You can even go further than that into ninths, elevenths, and thirteenths. But for today, let's just keep it relatively simple and just stick to that major seven. What does parallel mean in this uh, instance? So I had to do a quick refresher on this this morning. I feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's always good to do a little bit of a refresher, even if you've come across these kind of things before. I was looking this up this morning and making sure that I was totally clued up on what I was going to be talking about. And hopefully this isn't complete nonsense. So parallel movement in music is where you have a series of chords. In this case, essentially two with some passing chords in between. Um, they have the same intervallic structure as one another. And that's just a fancy way of saying, you know, the intervals in the first chord are the same as the intervals in the other chord. You just move every single one of those notes up or down or whatever, you know, it depends on the context. In this particular sequence, we're moving the D major seventh chord up a minor third so that F is now the root, A is the third, C is the fifth, and E is the seventh. Okay, and before I go, just a few other quick tips with this one. First thing to watch out for, I'd say, is the ghost note and the hammer on in that first bar right here. So you want to make sure you've got a solid articulation on both. See, that, that first time I did it, it wasn't so great. Make sure you get a nice solid um, ghost note. And my key thing with ghost notes is making sure, you know, I've got some other fingers muting the string. Fingers in this hand, I mean, uh, muting the string so you don't get any unwanted harmonics or anything ringing out or anything like that. Okay, you want that nice solid percussive sound. And then hammer-ons. It's all about landing with conviction with, in this case, actually, I was doing it with my little finger just then, but in the um, in the lick itself, third finger is also totally valid. Um, in terms of what fingers you do use in general, you know, I'm not, a, uh, I would say, whatever's comfortable for you it does have some awkward stretches in it. So first and fourth finger, 
mm. are going to be your dominant fingers here. And that's kind of relating to the Samandal technique, an upright bass technique where you use your first, second, and your, your fourth finger, sometimes your third and your fourth together. You know, it's a totally valid technique on the electric bass where the frets down in the lower register especially are quite large. There's also some tricky moments of string crossing um, in this series of 16th notes. Okay, so watch out particularly for that jump from E back up to the A um, in the in the first part of the of the lick, and you can achieve that with the just with the fourth finger, just doing a quick jump. You know, it doesn't need to. It could be a bar, but you know, I don't have the biggest um, little finger in the world. That's such a weird thing to say, isn't it? But um, yeah, it's totally achievable as long as you anticipate it. I think. And yeah, that's all there is to it. You know, slow that right down until it's comfortable under your hands. The variation in the second bar might also need some attention. So this is the part that goes. Okay. Try using your fourth finger on the A and then your third finger on the E before jumping up the octave with a little slide. Again, using your fourth finger. Oh man, I did that so badly, didn't I? Once this lick is comfortable in D, try moving up to F. And you know, there is uh, an interesting rhythm up to that F. You could think of each position in this lick as uh, a pentatonic shape with a major seventh, really. So D major pentatonic is like that, but obviously you're going, you're introducing that seventh, um, and but that that's basically the only note from outside of the simple pentatonic scale that you're just adding to add a little bit more color. Um, it also does go a little bit higher up to this E and to this A in uh, in the first position, you know, obviously. We've got, you know, but it's the same intervals again. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. Let me know if you have any thoughts. Leave me a comment below. Also, if you're a Patreon member, you'll be able to get the backing track for this one and download a PDF of the transcription. And that'll be in tab and standard notation. Um, I really appreciate everyone who's signing up to the Patreon. I really appreciate the support. It's enabling me to make content like this more often. And that can only be a good thing, hopefully. <laughs> oh yeah, before I go, just a quick note on this bass because I'm always getting asked about it. It's a Heyman 4040 bass. Uh, they were, Heyman were a short-lived British luthier, uh, sadly no longer with us. However, they did then become uh, Shergold guitars who are still around today. But yeah, this bass, the 4040, was the only bass that Heyman made. This is from, I think, 1975. Um, it's really unusual and that's definitely what drew it to me. You know, it's got these double split coil pickups. I've put a bit of electrical tape over this bit just to stop any unwanted popping you know it's still a bit there if I do touch the pickup but you know a quirk of the bass but uh I, you know I've learned to live with it this little hollow bit underneath the pit guard as well that's interesting the bridge looks crazy interesting note about this bass as well this particular bass the uh, original neck was replaced by one of the previous owners um it just been bowed and like it's been really messed up um but this neck is from a Shergold bass, um, which I believe is, you know, almost identical to the um, original necks on these basses. Um, and to make it, you know, look authentic, they did actually get a custom decal made for it up here. Um, so, you know, the, these, these basses were notorious for losing, uh, for this bit coming out and getting lost. Um, but yeah, um, it's a nice uh, sort of little refit job on something that, you know, almost all original, um, very, very unusual. And yeah, one of my uh, one of my favorite basses that I have. Tone wise, I'd say, you know, it sits somewhere between 
a jazz bass, you know, having these two pickups, but also, you know, somewhere maybe a little bit like a Rickenbacker. Um, but yeah, definitely a character all of its own. Really, really cool. Um, yeah, and that just about covers it for me. Have a good one, guys, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.